In half an hour, the jazz singer Annie Ross is Georgie Fame's guest with the tribute to the songwriter Hoagie Carmichael. Between now and then, a half hour in which anything can happen, and probably will, with Russell Harty. Hello to you, dear audience, and welcome to the party. There's lots of interesting people here, and Russell Harty. <laughs> Thank you kindly, thank you kindly. Welcome, cold night in London. Good evening. <laughs> Amongst those scheduled to appear in tonight's event were Mr. Kenny Everett and Miss Penelope Keith. <laughs> Mr. Everett, that renowned media grasshopper, <laughs> parrot turned clown, has uh, <laughs> dressed on screen. Hello, Russia, darling. Let me run my fingers through your hair. I have a little message for you, Russell. Uh, you have that nutty sex pet, Kenny Everett. Later on in the show, have yeah, we love him. <laughs> <laughs> it's been ages to get it like that. <laughs> don't, don't encourage him. He's Mr. Marcel Wave, a very clever gentleman who will be doing an, imperson a, an impersonation. My hair's all gone wrong. Of Mr. Kenny Everett later in the program. Now then, the three most famous female faces in the country at the moment are the Queen, the Princess of Wales, and my first guest, ladies and gentlemen, Penelope Keith. A mirror or something. You, a little mirror. you won't put you won't lay about me, will you? No, I promise, Russell. Yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have we finally kissed goodbye to Audrey Forbes Hamilton forever? Yes. For ever. Forever, yes. There's to be no uh, happily ever after. Well, the, the story was about her trying to get back to the manor, and she mm. got back to the manor, she married the man she loved, and that's that. That's we all happy ended happily ever after. Yes. And can you, before we lay her to rest, account yourself personally for the phenomenal success of it? It was a romance. Was it anything to do with... That's not straight out of my head. I don't know that when, we, when it was first so successful, there were various leaders written in newspapers and things about why it was a success. Was it the class system? Was it the hankering after the old order or various things? But in actual fact, I was interviewed by a Swedish journalist who said, asked me why it was a success. And I said, I don't know, you tell me. And she said, because it's a romance. And that was interesting, coming from someone who was foreign to mm. our manners mm. and order. Did you say Swedish? Yes. Because they are rather cold in Sweden. They do a lot of Bergman things, don't they? Ingmar Bergman That's things. right. I mean, and they, they like the warmth and the love in it all. As, as we all do. Yes. Now, warmth and love, it, it pervades your uh, coming up screen life. You're, you're about to embark on, a, on a big, the biggest screen. We're going to see a lot more of you. I mean, not more of you, but uh, more that way of you. More that way, yes. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is that? Uh, it's a film called Priest of Love. In fact, I made it like um, two years ago, virtually now, and it's about the life of D.H. Lawrence. And I play a woman called the Honorable Dorothy Brett, who was in fact on the fringes of the Bloomsbury set. Yeah. She was an artist. She went to Slade as a young girl and um, was introduced to Lawrence by Mark Gertler and fell in love, I suppose, with Lawrence. And when he had this idea of going to Mexico to set up uh, a, communion, a community, really, of like-minded souls. He said he had a great dinner at the Café Royal and said to everybody, all his various friends, Middleton, Murray, and lots of intellectuals, all come to Mexico with me. And they all got very drunk and said yes. And when he turned up at the ship, there was only one person there, and that was Dorothy Brett. That's you? Yes. Uh, and so, she, because she was a real-life person, is she the re first real-life person yes, you she have is. portrayed? Yes, she is. And I was very lucky because I was able to meet her brother her brother was married to Zena Dare and I met Zena Dare's two daughters and they had known Brett as an old aunt she Dorothy, used to, Brett. Uh, Dorothy Brett yeah. she used to come over she was called Brett eventually yeah. Yeah. and she used to come over from Mexico she only died about five six years ago now what characteristics do you have well um, I think she's the nicest sweetest most innocent person I've ever played she was deaf 
she started to go deaf when she was 17, so when she met Lawrence, she was stone deaf, and she had an ear trumpet, a tin ear trumpet. And eventually, um, in the film, she worked up to a sort of electric ear trumpet. It was like little cat's whiskers, yeah. but she couldn't hear it. How old are you? In the film. In the film. Um, she <laughs> <laughs> I meant in the film. I didn't mean yeah. in the film. In the film. Um, she's in her late 20s, 26, 27. Right. Now, we're going to have a look at you in uh, a situation where, where, which is peculiar, to say the least. Yes, it is. Um, she, as I said, she was besotted by Lawrence, and she loved Lawrence dearly. I don't think it was a sort of sexual love. Um, he... Um, Did he? Well, no, I don't think so. I think he felt he was... He should try to have an affair with Brett. His wife at the time was having an affair with some, someone else right. and they happened to be in Italy. Right. And he went to her bedroom one night. Right. And this is a, this is a scene where she, where he, that's Ian McKellen, D.H. Lawrence, Playing D.H. Lawrence. Actually appears to call upon you, Penelope Keith, uh, As Dorothy, Dorothy Brett, Brett in her bedroom. In a, in a bedroom. Yes. Your beard, it's all soft. I always thought it would be bristly. Shall we blow the candle out? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear... When do we see this? I think it opens the first or second week in, in February. And it is called Priest of it's Love. It's called Priest of Love. Mm. Well, you filmed it, a lot of it in Mexico. Yes, yes. I did most of, nearly all mine. That should have happened in Italy. And in fact, we did that at Shepparton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my luck. Mm. But we did, in fact, get to Mexico. I spent three weeks in Mexico. Were you poorly? Poorly in Mexico? No, I was the strongest one of the lot. Everyone else went down like flies with the Aztec two-step. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was Ava Gardner's word, isn't it? Love. What is it? Well, no. well, it's the same as Montezuma's Revenge. Of course, it is. Yes, the, yes. You know, and Central you have to America. run fast. That's right. Yes. <laughs> but no, I didn't at all. No, I, I found the altitude thing most peculiar. I had to ride a horse, and um, very high up, about nine thousand feet up, and I realised what the Olympic Games people went through. Do you mean did you go dizzy at all? Yes. Yes, very dizzy. Mm. But you rode successfully. Oh yes. Of course. <laughs> now then, uh, another thing that you're now embarking on, having got, gotten rid of. Well, is gotten rid of the is rid of the right word? Are you happy to kiss goodbye to Audrey? Uh, oh yes, I played her for I'd done twenty one episodes, which is ten and a half hours, and mm. that's a long time. It's longer than playing Hamlet, you know. Yes, it's longer than playing Hamlet twice. As yes, well, exactly, isn't it, it is. Mm. So no, you're now doing a, you're now going into up up north. I'm going up north. What are you yes. going to do? I mean, I don't mean. I mean, I'm not going up north to do it, but I'm doing a play from up north called Hobson's Choice by Brick House. Yes. What part do you play? In I that? play the part of Maggie Hobson. This it's, is on the stage. One ought to say. It's on the stage. On the stage. One ought to say. Yes, mm -hmm. it's going to be at the Haymarket Theatre in, in London in the new year, and it's a marvelous play. It's a sort of everyone thinks they say, "Oh, what a wonderful play." What's it about? Because you know, <laughs> you've because heard of it. You, you've, everyone sort of heard of it. Right. Hobson's Choice. Who is are part you of in language. that? Then? I play a woman called Maggie Hobson, who's the eldest of three daughters of a fairly tyrannical father, mm -hmm. who runs a shoe shop in Salford. Lanks. In the in the eighteen in Lanks in the eighteen eighties, and Maggie is the eldest. She's thirty, and considered an old maid and left on the shelf, and um, she decides to change her life and make it work for her. And whom does she elect to change? Well, her she life? takes up with a craftsman who makes boots in the cellar. 
Where are you picking up all the, oh, this up business from? This up business? Well, I've picked it up for the last four years because I'm married to a Lancashire man, you see. And, do, and does he teach you things? I mean, that's... <laughs> Yes, Rod is my dialogue coach. He, yes. yes. Mm. Uh, and when he's nibbling your ear on the pillow, he's actually... I say, how do you say, S-A-L-O-R-D? <laughs> <laughs> I bet Truly, you do. yes, yes. I bet yes, you do. Yes, yes, if he right. speaks like that, as one knows that he does, actually, I and mean, he speaks like I do in a kind yes, of way, in fact, we're yes. from the same end of the dominant, right. aren't we? That's right. Do you teach him how to speak sort of proper? No, not at all. No, no, he occasionally, when he considers I'm getting a bit uppish, he speaks proper. And when I consider he's getting a bit uppish Lancashire, I speak Lancashire, yes. Is it a strain for you, though, that the Lancastrian has? It's, it's a different music. The thing is to get the music of the language. It isn't just a question of saying up as mm. opposed to up. It's just to hear the rhythm of the words. That's the thing about accents. I know when I've done American, that's the thing. It's the music. It's the different emphasis You see, a lot people of people give. would say it's ugly, ugly. Oh, it's not ugly. No, I think it's lovely. I mean, the interesting thing was about, about Roddy's accent was that I'd, I'd worked in Manchester and Liverpool, and so for me, a Lancashire accent was that rather hard urban accent of Manchester and Liverpool. His is a rural one. He comes from just north of um, um, Burnley, mm -hmm. and it's more rural, so the R's are rolled. It's, it's fascinating. He rolls his R's, does he? <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> you and Roddy have a baby now at home, haven't you? We have a small dog, yes. 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 What, what is it called? <laughs> it is called Cora. Is it well behaved? Occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> what kind yes. of a dog is it's, it? It's a corgi dog. It's a small corgi. Yappy dog. Is um, one following any kind of precedent? By not it? at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're following the precedent of, uh, that Roddy wanted a Rottweiler. A what? A Rottweiler. <laughs> we wanted a Rottweiler. They're very butch dogs with enormous shoulders. Yeah, and a, bit like, a bit like Kenny Everett. <laughs> that's right. That's who he looks like. And he's, you know, and I thought that would be a bit large to cart around dressing rooms and put in small cars and take to London. Mm. So I said, let's have a smaller one to start mm. with. So he'd had three. He'd started off having a corgi as a small boy uh, when he was nine. So we thought we'd try a corgi. Good. Well, I hope you and the accent and Roddy and the corgi and everything. Incidentally, you, do you have, as we all should have from today onwards, do you have a spare room ready in case a guest arrives in the middle of the night with snowbound? Oh, room? yes, of course. I think we all should We have. must all do it from Absolutely. tonight. Absolutely, from tonight, I've yes. got something ready. I've also got yes. something in the deep freeze. Yes, good. We yes. all have. I must do that, yes. Of course. Yes. Meanwhile, you'll stay with us throughout the rest of the programme. I'd love to. In a state mm. of preparedness. Of course. Meanwhile, for both your ventures, the best of luck, Penelope Keith. Thank you. What with one thing and another, it's been a right royal year. I'm very pleased tonight to be able to introduce to you a rare group of people who added very special luster to the wedding day, the royal wedding. They've just released a new LP of royal music. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, under their director, Barry Rose, the choir of St Paul's Cathedral.
triangle. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, your big scene was obviously on the, on the wedding day, and when we were watching it, as, and watch it as we shall frequently, because it's cassetted and it's broadcast last Sunday, everything seemed to go perfectly well. There, were, there was no hitch. Were there any things that went on behind the scenes that you might allow us a glimpse of? Uh, one or two things, but one I oughtn't to talk about myself. I think you ought to ask the choristers about this. Perhaps this young man here will tell you about it. I feel I ought to retire at this point. But don't get too far away. No, no. <laughs> What, you've got a secret for us, have you? You sure you won't be beheaded after you tell this story? I don't know about that. But... You'll see. Mm. Well, during the Matthias anthem, uh, he was beating very well. I don't know what to say. <laughs> and he his, was. Yes, and yeah. his arms were beating up and down frantically. Yeah. And uh, during a very loud bit, he knocked the lampshade off the thing and it went flying over onto the ground somewhere. And, and, and did anybody retrieve it? Yes, uh, one of the sacristan at the time. He picked it up and uh, secretly put it back on, which, well, he didn't actually put it on then, but at the end of service. You mean he put it on, on his head? No. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only untoward event that happened, was it? I think it was, yes. But yes. You, did, you did very well with all that. Like, were you up early in the morning time? Uh, well, I think they were up most of the night, um, because there was so much noise on Luggard Hill that they couldn't really get to sleep in right. the night flies myself. They, they do work an awf awfully hard schedule, these, these chaps and these... Uh, we forget that there are chaps standing behind us. We're concentrating on the kids. But what is your... What, you're working at Christmas time, aren't you? Yes. What is your name? Uh, Peter Orsi. And what, what is your Christmas schedule? Um, well, we have um, so many practices that we forget about um, other things, such as working in class. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> so you work Christmas Eve and Christmas Day? Oh, yes. And yeah. when do you start your... When do you start... When do you go back to Wigan? I'll, I'll go back to this Wigan. one's from Wigan. Can you believe it? All the best people leave Wigan. <laughs> when do you go back home? When uh, do you start your holiday? On the 25th evening, the evening of the Christmas. So day. you hang your stockings up. Do you, you, Father Christmas will come again, will he, on Christmas night for you when you've done your yeah, work? Definitely. Will he? Yeah, yeah. What will he be bringing you, I wonder? <laughs> anyway, look, we wish you the best of luck at Christmas time. I have they, some of these I've met before. They support daft football teams, some of this like that. Oh, well, yes, we did, we did meet when we did the programme about that particular song we don't right. talk about, but right. they, they do support daft football teams, yes. But Arsenal's the best team. Meanwhile, yeah. Barrow Rose, thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it is. Thank you. Barrow Rose supports the people. <laughs> it is not generally known that my next guest has been both a choir boy and for one year only a probationary priest and the fact that he was a priest for just a year perhaps suggests something catastrophic happened at the end of that year. To find out, will you please welcome Mr. Kenny Everett. on the air, on the wireless, I said, Penny, marry me, darling. I didn't And she hear didn't. You. I didn't hear you. You married a policeman, I you know. rotter. <laughs> <laughs> so Have you put enough money in the meter? Hello. No, they've taken the meter away. Hello, Russell. Hello. Tell us a bit to begin with, before one's, one becomes more ruffled than rustled. What your, uh, get yourself an eat inside What your life was like as a choir boy and, uh, if you can, and um, as a probationary priest? It was quite good. It was good training being a priest because we used to sing in the choir a lot, like them persons. And uh, it was good training for doing radio jingles because you learn all the harmonies, you know? Yeah. But it's very sparse. I, I only did a year of it. It was very sparse eating wise. What kind of faith did you adhere to at this time? That doesn't follow on from eating. <laughs> you must rehearse, Russell. Faith what? Faith what? Brown? I mean, was it Roman Catholic or was it... Uh, oh, it was Anglican? very Roman Catholic. Mother was a Catholic. Um, she went for Catholic because of heaven. Because they, you know, when you die, if you're a Catholic, you go straight to heaven. And sh she told me that was great, because it's all fluffy and pink <laughs> in heaven. As I interrupted your eating. Oh, yeah. Well, it was just that we used to starve um, in, in the priest training college, because if you starve, you get closer to God because you're on the verge of death. <laughs> Do you want to take your rough off? 
Oh, no, it looks terrible without the ruffle. Oh, right. Getting quite attached to this. <laughs> <laughs> and how long did you... What, what in fact, uh, pushed you out at the end of the year? Or who? Oh, the priests. <laughs> they thought I wouldn't make a good priest. I don't know why, do you? <laughs> I know all the words. In Omni Parties, Affiliate Spirit of Sancti Amen. Et in tree bird out all that stuff. Bit of echo when this goes out. Oh, it's live. Oh, it's God. live. It's live. It's oh, God. Live. When this goes out. Now, you've, since that time, done a myriad of things. I mean, jumped on to Radio Caroline. Was it Caroline? Yes. No, it's the one a quarter of a mile away. What? Radio London. No, no, no. I mean, you did, weren't you, were you a pirate? Yes. Radio London. Oh, Radio London. Yeah. But uh, eventually, let's skip all the rest of your life. I mean, we're not going through it down memory lane. Oh. <laughs> That's it. Go on, push me over the edge. You're so near to the edge, you don't take an awful lot of pushing. <laughs> um, <laughs> you ended up then interviewing the Beatles, of all people. Did I? Mm. <laughs> yes, I did, actually. But the, the Jelly Baby Company... Um, you, th th this is the story. It might take a while. And then we don't want to hear you. <laughs> They love you. <laughs> anyway, somebody threw a jelly baby at Ringo Starr. Oh, <laughs> oh all right. There. He gets very peculiar. Well, he is very peculiar. Somebody threw a jelly baby at Ringo Starr one day, and he picked it up and ate it on stage. So the jelly baby company, of course, thought, this is a good trick. We'll send Everett round the States with them uh, on behalf of Jelly Baby Company Limited. <laughs> Your microphone is oh. attached. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if this one's the microphone, what does that one do? That echo. That's a That's What the is echo. this for? That's, That's the echo. echo. Dario. <laughs> 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 well, this is... No, anyway, I went round the States and I tried to interview the Beatles, but they were so sophisticated and I was so green and Liverpudlian that I used to, the same question every day. What are your plans for the future, John? <laughs> and John, of course, being a, you know, he didn't have much time for people who didn't know as much as he did. He, God bless his soul. He said, you're not a very good interviewer, are you, Ken? <laughs> so I, I used to run over to Paul, who was a very sweetheart and still is, and I, I said, oh, Paul, help, I've got to fill off an hour of interview. And he'd say, come into the bathroom. And he'd say, ask any question, and I'll just go on for half an hour. I said, what are your plans for the future? <laughs> And he did, he burbled on for half an hour, God bless him. Uh, so you're not an old... <laughs> mm. Look. Oh. What, um... I think you're great. You're lovely yourself. Oh! <laughs> what, uh, you're not a good interviewer, but you do mm. do a marvellous thing on Saturday mornings, which is you, you promote quite regularly on a Saturday morning now. Is it Radio 1 or 2 or both? Do they combine? Oh, no, Your beard's frightfully wet at the moment, Ken. I don't um, know, they all mix up together. Radio's one to nine inclusive. I think it's two. You, you, we, you play regularly on a Saturday morning this marvellous piece of tape, which if we could take time out just to listen to, which is a woman in Utah. Utah's well, it's about 1950, and they sent this, the BBC sent this woman to Tunbridge Wells to interview one of the locals. And now the BBC use it as how not to interview somebody. It's the world's worst interview. Listen to this. What's the nicest thing about Tunbridge Wells? What, what? What's the nicest thing about Tunbridge Wells? I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't there anything nice about it? No. Nothing at all? No, I know nothing about Tunbridge Wells. But it must be a healthy place. Hmm? It must be a healthy place. Oh, it's a healthy place because you go back to the 15th or 16th century, can't you? Yes. And Perhaps any... you don't know that. Oh, yes, I knew that. But anyway, oh. it must be healthy for you to be... Looking so wonderful at this age. Well, why shouldn't I look wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that of course comes from the inner spirit, I know. Hmm? That comes from the inner spirit. In inner from, from your own spirit. Yes, it is. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say, but I can say that it bleeds you, I will. Uh. My heart in the kind of way it bleeds for her, because yeah. there must be a lot of... I mean, you do get caught with some people. Are, are, are you ever embarrassed by interviewers, Pinot, because you are frequently interviewed? Uh, well, no, I try to keep talking. You do? Mm. Hence the reason I've stopped now, Russell. Yes, I, 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 I <laughs> no. 
I don't think I am. No, I, I, I think if there was ever an embarrassing question or something, I would answer monosyllabically. Yes. I don't think normally. But you've never bought on. Do you try to tell each one a new thing? Or, or do you, yes, do you have except it's already difficult when they ask the same questions. I know it mm. is, which they do. Like, what, like right. what are your plans for the future? Right. Actually, <laughs> they're very kind in England, interviewers. You and Peaki, very kind and sweet. But in America, it's, what are the size of your particles? <laughs> it's all... It's all it's all personal. Can you, the, you do American talk shows, do you, or have? I've done one, yes. Do they know who you are there? Uh, yeah, I'm on, I'm on NBC. Doing what? Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> in the IBA's annual reports and accounts, 1978-79, Her Majesty's Stationery Office, £1.50, it says the Kenny Everett video shows, when you were on the other side, reveals a considerable split amongst viewers. Young people, especially teenagers to whom it is particularly addressed, seem to revel in it. An older generation seems to find some of it objectionable. Mm. Now, do you deliberately set out... This is one of the dumb questions. Yes, it is. Dumb questions, mm. um, what, are your plans for, what are your plans for the future? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got lots of different things in the new show, uh, because Hot Gossip... Um, who are here next week. Who are here next week. Right. Exposing their particles. <laughs> uh, we introduced them onto the scene, and a lot of people got very upset because they'd never seen particles on television before. It's, uh, why not? I mean, you see it at home. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> you may do. I mean, we don't get out. <laughs> Penelope and I don't get out much, so we don't see. When you're a sweet old-fashioned thing. I know. Listen, one of the things, one of the things you do do, you do do, is actually to use a lot of props in your video thing. And you brought a prop with you tonight. Oh, it's the old helium trick. Shall you prop off? Yes. Won't be a mole. He's going to prop off. What's the to... old helium trick? <laughs> well, I. <laughs> This is a great party trick, which you should never try at parties. Extremely dangerous, but I'm all right, because the BBC are always trying to get rid of me. So you don't mind. It's all right, dear one. It's your mic. Sorry. <laughs> Terribly sorry. Oh, it's not working anymore. Sorry. <laughs> now, this stuff... Um, so, you're all right. Stand. She's quite nervous about it. Yes, this. I am, very. It makes, your, uh, it makes your throat go peculiar. It makes you talk funny, like this. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to try it, Russell. It makes you so <laughs> Have a go, you'll love it, Russell. Big deep breath. Big deep breath. Big, big deep breath. Big, big deep breath. <laughs> I don't know whether you're talking or not. Darling, you'll shrivel your vocal cords forever. No more. No more, Russell. She said I can do it. No, don't do any more. Sounded better in his life. Don't do any more. No, don't do any more. Turn it off. Turn it off. Now, honestly, it's quite a serious moment. On no account must anybody go out and try that. They must not try that because it, it's funny and dumb. Naughty poos. <laughs> Actually, talking of naughty poos, can we go on to the video cassette? I think we actually have to. I think we, you, I think we about have to close the program. Oh, can I tell a joke? It's on my new cassette, folks. It's available over the counter or under it, and it goes like this: The boy stood in the chip shop, eating red hot scallops. One fell down his trousers and scalded him on the ankle. <laughs> Missed his bollocks completely. <laughs> I, wish, I, wish, I wish to draw a veil over tonight. Oh, you must try no, it. <laughs> Not. I wish to bring I wish to bring to a close tonight's anarchic half hour. Thank you very much for watching us. We'll see you on Thursday in Manchester and here next Tuesday. Good night, goodbye, thank you.
Well, as he said, Russell Harty is back later in the week with the writers of the comedy series Heidi High, David Croft and Jimmy Perry, and two of its stars, Ruth Maddock and Paul Shane. That's on Thursday night at half past eight.